Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, just over five years ago, uh, the Dean led a strategic plan that um, set the course for Mount Sinai to become known as a, an innovation and discovery center within the United States. And, um, leading the way in genetics and genomics, establishing us as a leader in computational capabilities and big data, um, and getting us recognized as a major center for cancer, amongst many other things. Just over the last year, uh, Dr. Charney has led another strategic initiative, and we're very fortunate that he's here to, this morning to outline the vision of that strategic plan. So I want to thank Dr. Charney for taking the time this morning, and I'm not going to delay handing you over to him. So thank you. This goes to 9.30? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so I, for, I apologize for, to those of you that are at convocation uh, because I'm, re I'm repeating what I said at convocation, but uh, hopefully we'll have time uh, for questions. And uh, there we go. So uh, f first I'm going to review how last year went uh, for the school, and then I'm going to get into the uh, strategic plan. So we had another good year. Uh, these are some metrics that deans care about. Uh, so we, uh, this is 2016 data because 17 uh, is not all in, but we ranked number two in research dollars per PI, which means that we compete, you know, uh, with the best in the country in getting NIH uh, dollars. We're number three in research dollars per square foot. That's not a great number. Uh, for those of you who are saying, why don't I get more research space? Uh, so we, we need another research building, and that is part of the uh, strategic plan, which I'll get to. The, um, the next one was something that was a nice surprise, that in the, in the first week in August, Nature um, came out with, with what's called the Nature Innovation Index, which looks at how often the science of an institution is cited in, in patents. So uh, Nature felt that that was a, a good uh, index of innovation of the science of a given institution. So we were ranked 10th uh, in the world, and uh, we're, very, we're very proud of that because that's the kind of environment that we have worked uh, hard to put into the Mount Sinai. That is, not only do we publish in great journals and get NIH grants, but our science makes a difference in the lives of our uh, patients. And in terms of innovation, Mount Sinai Innovation Partners has been very active in tech transfer and spinning out uh, companies, most notably uh, Semaphore, which is not a startup, uh, but a genetic testing and information uh, a business totally owned by Mount Sinai and uh, has over now 250 employees. But that's just an example. The, uh, as you know, with the acquisition of the Continuum Health System, our faculty has grown uh, dramatically, including in the Department of Medicine. What, what's the current number? 2,200. 2,200 of uh, faculty, which includes full-time and, and, and part-time, maybe the largest department of medicine in the country. And we've worked very hard to combine the cultures of the former continuum system, which involved three different medical schools, into uh, the Mount Sinai culture, and I think that is is going well. And this, we're continuing to work at that. A lot of new appointments in the past year. Uh, two new chairs, uh, Sean Morris and Jerry Atrix. Uh, Al Sue decided to uh, step down on his on his own and is taking on other initiatives in the health system. And we have a new chair of emergency medicine have named several uh, deans. I'd like to uh, note Stephen Borokov, who did, has done a great job as the head of the Tisch Cancer Institute. He decided, again, to step down, not my decision, and we've named Ramon Parsons as the new head of the Tisch Cancer Institute, who notably was just elected into the National Academy of Medicine. Uh, so we're, we, hope, we look forward to Stephen's leadership as dean for cancer innovation and uh, Ramon taking over the Tisch Cancer Institute. Michael Lightman has done a great job, in my opinion, in, in leading graduate medical education. For the system, we have the largest uh, number of residents 
house staff of any medical school in the country. And I think I may have a slide on that. It's to over to, uh, 2,000. Eric Shad has become the CEO of the uh, of Semaphore, the new company, and is maintaining a role at Mount Sinai as Dean for Precision Medicine. As part of the strategic plan, uh, we have formed several new research institutes, including an addiction institute, and given the opiate crisis, we think that's timely. Uh, Bob Wright is the founder of a new Exposome Research Institute, which focuses on the effect of the environment on health. Uh, Doug Jabs, a vision research institute. Elizabeth Howe, a women's health research institute, and so on and so forth. Named a number of senior associate deans. Particularly, uh, I want to note Eric Gendon as uh, a dean for clinical affairs that he will focus along with being chair of ENT on building our practices on the, on the west side, the faculty practice uh, west side uh, growth. Eric will help with that both at Mount Sinai West and at uh, Mount Sinai St. Luke's. The student class. So we have uh, an unbelievable student class that started in August. I like to joke, but I think it's true that not many of us would get into Mount Sinai when you have a mean GPA of 3.83 and an MCAT, which is in the top 5%. They come from lots of great undergraduate schools. In my white coat ceremony speech, I noted some of the other um, talents of the class, including um, one student who grew up at the Carver Houses. And uh, I, I mentioned that that's a short walk, but a long road to get to our school. So she's an inspiration. Uh, we have athletes in the class. We have a, a, a student who said he can do a five by five Rubik's Cube. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but I think it's tough. <laughs> we have one student who I said is, uh, I wanna meet because she has been a part-time fortune teller. And so I felt given our strategic plan, I'd like to talk to her. <laughs> she also happens to speak five languages and is a boxing instructor and a gourmet chef. So uh, it's a terrific class. And the PhD students uh, who, who started are also you know, very talented. You can see the GPA. For those of you who haven't been in school lately, 4.0 is perfect. Lots of accomplishments in med ed over, over the year. Uh, I'm not going to go through that. This is all online, by the way. I want to note that the Flex Med class, which is the next generation of our humanities and medicine uh, program, which gives early uh, early admission, they don't matriculate until they finished uh, college to students that, uh, not only humanities majors, but now uh, we are recruiting students that are uh, majors in, com in computational science, in physics, and in chemistry, where it's very hard to have a pre-med curriculum and then come to medical school. So we waive a lot of the uh, requirements, and they're not allowed to take the MCAT. We're very focused on uh, wellness, uh, both at the medical student and graduate school level. So we've de we're develop, uh, uh, developing some new programs for our students. And I've just asked uh, Bert Dreyer to convene a task force to work on issues related to wellness and work-life balance for our faculty. So you'll hear uh, a lot more about that in the coming uh, months. So I mentioned graduate medical education. We have the largest GME program in the United States. Uh, we have, as you can see on this slide, almost 2,200 uh, residents. Number two is New York Presbyterian with about 1,750, and then you can see the other uh, programs. So uh, we're training a, a lot of uh, great people and want to have the best come on to our faculty. So this is the, the rank, now, uh, as you, many of you know, now U.S. News ranks residency uh, programs. And uh, the, uh, this ranking is, is from actually last year, 2017-18, just uh, came out. And I'm working with every department to improve this ranking. Because, as, you know, our hospital, Mount Sinai Hospital, made the honor roll um, again. And so it's ranked 18th in the country among 
5,200 hospitals, yet we don't have enough of our training programs ranked in the top 18. And, and so there's a methodology uh, to how your residency program is ranked. It's not a perfect uh, methodology. I'm not going to get into it now, but our program directors are becoming experts on that. Uh, so we, we want to improve uh, these numbers. We're, we think we're better than these numbers, and we, we need to uh, improve them uh, by getting much more knowledgeable at how the ranking actually occurs. It involves doximity. So um, how many of you are on doximity? All right, not enough. Um, everybody needs to be on doximity because that's how the voting occurs. If you're not on doximity, you don't get uh, to vote. Uh, the graduate program has also improved dramatically. This is the most talented class, we believe, that has ever entered the PhD program. Very strong metrics. Uh, master's programs are growing uh, dramatically, particularly the MPH program. And uh, again, I'm not going to go through all the accomplishments, but uh, Marta Filosova, who's been the dean for about the last year, of the graduate school has got a lot of new programs, including a um, flex graduate program, which will be an accelerated program for PhD students uh, and MD PhD students if they, if they want to have an acceleration of getting the MD PhD. So we, we don't, we want to shorten the time to get an MD PhD. And there are several ways we can do that. Uh, a lot of students, it takes eight or nine years. And by, you know, by the time you finish that and you, you go into residency and you do a fellowship, you're in your 40s. That's not good, you know. And if you want to be a scientist, you start writing your NIH grant. And if you don't get it in the first try, you're 45. You can be president of the United States at 45. So we, we've got to fix that. And there are a number of ways we're working on it, including uh, shorten the number of years to get your PhD. Uh, some of our training programs now particularly psychiatry who've got a grant from NIH, that you get your PhD as part of the residency. It's expanded by two years, but it shortens the whole process. And I've been talking to medicine in terms of fellowships. We already have about half time available for research that if you want to get your PhD as part of your fellowship, it just it would expand by a year, a year and a half. So it would be much shorter. You end up with your MD, PhD. And in many cases, when you get your MD, PhD as part of your fellowship, you don't have to do a postdoc. You can come right on the faculty and be a physician investigator. We, we've developed a couple of new affiliations uh, to enhance some areas that we were not strong because we're not part of a major university. That's particularly true in engineering and um, and chemistry, so we've established an affiliation with a very strong biomedical engineering department at City College where we can exchange uh, students, we can uh, share courses, so it's very important uh, to our graduate school. And we, the affiliation with Rensselaer has been working out very well, including a, a lot of joint uh, funding. As is true with Stony Brook, and I should note that those of you who have been involved with the Stony Brook affiliation, where we've uh, put out a lot of pilot funds for uh, joint projects, there's a uh, conference coming up at the end of October uh, where we're reviewing the progress, and there are going to be a lot of presentations of the investigators from both Mount Sinai and Stony Brook that, um, that involve the pilot projects, and they're going to be updating us on what their progress has been. We've recently established a new affiliation with the Institute Pasteur um, as it relates to virology. We're very strong in virology. They're very strong in virology. So we've established a similar program with the Institute, uh, sharing resources and exchanging um, uh, students. Some new classrooms, the room formerly known as the boardroom, uh, where I think you have some meetings, is now what I call Center for Innovation and Discovery. It's got whiteboards, you can write all over them um, for, with new ideas. Uh, we've got new classrooms. This is all on the fifth floor near where you have other uh, 
where you have faculty offices. And for those of you who don't use the student center, uh, we've renovated that. We've made uh, lemonade out of a lemon because it was a pretty uh, disastrous place and it's relevant. The architect was terrific and has made it a, a great place for our medical students and our graduate students. We're work, working very hard to engage our alumni. I know medicine is doing that. Uh, that's important not only for ranking purposes, uh, but also for fundraising uh, now that we've entered the next uh, capital campaign. Okay, let me get to the, uh, the strategic plan. Oh, I, sh I should note, uh, given all the work that Scott has done, um, well, I'll get to that at the end. This is, the, this is our description of semaphore. The strategic plan. So the first phase was developing the plan. And so we established 37 work groups involving many of the faculty in this room. So about the, over 200 faculty looking at uh, almost every aspect of what we do in, in the school from a research point of view, education. And we brought in 37 external advisory boards corresponding to each of those work groups. So we had about 100, we had 135 literally world experts come in, vet what the faculty uh, work groups came up with that involved some revision. And then we formed a uh, Mount Sinai Strategic Plan Council that looked at the plan, uh, made some recommendations, and then senior leadership like myself, you know, made some final decisions in finalizing uh, the plan. And, and then we presented the plan to the Board of Trustees in April of this year, 2017, and they approved the plan. So here are some of the guiding principles with the, in, in our development of the plan. Take advantage of the size and excellence of the health system. We have a huge health system. So when it comes to precision medicine and uh, the role of genomics in, in healthcare and epidemiology and so on and so forth, our health system can be a laboratory. We want to further um, enhance the medical and graduate education so it's unrivaled. To anticipate and fund new areas of research that result in fundamental discoveries that change the lives of our patients. The, the key characteristic of a great st uh, strategic plan is to anticipate what's not so obvious. So if you just uh, have a plan that's iterative, you know, that builds on what is known, it's okay, but it's not great. And one of the things we did in the last strategic plan, Barbara, which is actually 10 years ago, <laughs> um, it was 07, we made some decisions that, that worked. Not everything was perfect, but we made some decisions that were not obvious at the time, but it worked. We invested very heavily in high performance computing, very heavily in data science, which now seems obvious, but was not so obvious. Uh, 10 years ago. We totally uh, revolutionized our genomic footprint at Mount Sinai and so on and so forth. So we've got some new things in the plan that maybe um, are not so obvious and, and may or may not work, but that's okay. We are going to invest further in current areas of excellence and we overall want the plan to be an engine of discovery that creates more IP, collaborations with industry and more Mount Sinai companies. So that's the, the principles underlying the plan. So what are, what are we doing? We've established five new research institutes that are interdepartmental and multidisciplinary. I mentioned a couple. The Addiction Institute under the leadership of Yasmin Hurt, who also has just been elected to the National Academy of Medicine. I hope the press release has come out, Barry, on that. Has it? <laughs> or I'm anticipating that. But She's got in. Uh, the Adolescent Health Research Institute to, to um, you know, enhance what, what um, Angela Diaz has done in, in um, running that. The Exposome Institute 
to be led by Bob Wright, he's been printing money when it comes to grants. He's got 50 million, that department has over like $50 million in NIH funding because of the interest of NIH in understanding the role of the environment on health and disease, and he is at the cutting edge of that. A new in institute for transformative clinical trials, uh, given the size of our health system, we should have an enormous number of, of clinical trials ranging from phase one, investigator initiated, to phase two and phase three. So we want to be innovative in that space, and Anatine Galayans has, has been very innovative, and her team, in developing new methodologies for conducting clinical trials, new uh, biostatistical approaches, uh, and, and other areas that will enhance our ability to conduct clinical trials. We want to be a hub for NIH, and I know medicine wants that too. So um, medicine trials that are multi-center, we want to be the coordinating site for those trials. And I mentioned the Women's Health Research Institute. We're going to continue to invest and expand, and you can see these are divisions of medicine, uh, in, in disease areas, uh, diabetes, ki uh, GI, kidney, pulmonary, and also uh, pediatrics. To do that, we got to raise money. And, and associated with the strategic plan is a $1.5 billion capital campaign. And it is very important that many of you in this room are very involved in the fundraising and to identify grateful patients in your area that have the means to contribute uh, to the growth of these, uh, of these clinical and scientific areas. And, and Barbara and her leadership team can help connect you uh, with development in, uh, and, and partnering uh, with our capital campaign. We're going to invest in surgical and rehabilitation in, um, initiatives. We're building a surgical innovation lab at Mount Sinai West, and uh, we have developed a new academic department, which also relates to the health system and what's happening more globally, federally, around uh, delivery of, of health care. So we've established a new academic department of health system design and global health. We've recently established a new institute for next generation health care. For those of you who are interested, we have in the library, or the space formerly known as the library, established a, a prototype new clinic led by uh, David Sparks and uh, Joel uh, Dudley. And it involves uh, the latest in di digital approaches to medicine uh, to evaluate a patient in terms of wellness, um, vulnerability to disease, and preventative approaches. It's, he's calling it Laboratory 1.0. And it's the, the kind of clinic, it, and it, if it works in this, uh, in this prototype, that we can put all around town as a wellness center using the late, latest in digital medicine. So it's, it's in the library now. If you go in on 11th floor, you make a left, and you go all the way to the left, you'll see it. It's really amazing. Uh, we're going to invest heavily in medical education. We need, we're going to need to develop more space uh, for MedEd. We're working on that. And uh, uh, David and his team, David Muller, has identified several, several areas that we're going to invest in. We're also going to, in addition to this, we're going to invest, we have a donor that wants to invest in innovation and medical education uh, related to the latest um, advances in digital approaches to evaluating uh, vulnerability to disease and treatment of disease. So that initiative will partner with what Joel Dudley and his team is doing in the Institute for Medical Education, um, the Institute for Next Generation Healthcare. Uh, we need scholarship support. Uh, we want Mount Sinai's medical school to be eventually uh, debt-free as it relates to uh, tuition uh, support. Uh, so uh, we have set a goal uh, as the, for that as part of the strategic plan. We're going to invest heavily in graduate education as well. Major investment in precision medicine. And th th we've uh, put into the strategic plan $100 million uh, to invest in precision medicine. And this involves many departments, including the Department of, medical, of uh, Medicine. 
where we're going to um, invest further in high performance computing, uh, data, recruiting data scientists, enhancing our uh, footprint around uh, genetic sequencing, and also um, investing heavily in our tissue bank and our DNA collection. Right now, we have 40,000 uh, DNA samples, uh, all of which we've gotten consent from our patients, and we have a collaboration uh, with Regeneron, who is uh, sequence doing ex uh, ex uh, uh, zone, uh, sequencing of that uh, sample. And when, once it's done, it's going to be a bit of a race between Regeneron scientists and Mount Sinai scientists to evaluate um, the findings. But I'm sure many of you know uh, what I mean by precision medicine. It has not yet reached its potential in medicine, and we want to be on the cutting edge. So we're going to make major investments. And, and these are some of the reasons why we're going to do that. So I, I, would, I would like investigators in the Department of Medicine to take this on and uh, you know, become part of this strategic plan. So you're going to have to identify yourself, uh, and then we, you'll be part of it. Precision medicine touches uh, you know, all aspects of medicine, and not just in the Department of Medicine, but in cancer and brain disorders. And, and pediatrics, so that's why we're going to be making uh, such an investment. We're going to make major investments in immunology, over $100 million associated with the strategic plan. Uh, I've been lobbying heavily on this. I, the immunologists have been telling me that uh, immunology touches every, every area of medicine too, and I've become a believer. Uh, Mary Marad has become the leader of our immunology institute. She has established a tremendous immune monitoring core that uh, samples are being sent to, uh, to her uh, all around the country. And in fact, Memorial, um, I don't know if I'm saying this exactly accurately, but they had tr trouble running their CYTOF, which is a sophisticated uh, machine to measure uh, immune function. They've sent the machine CYTOF to Mount Sinai, to Miriam, uh, to run it, and that there's a collaboration between Memorial and Mount Sinai. Our Drug Discovery Institute is also going to get more funding so that we can commercialize Mount Sinai science. So we can discover new treatments for IBD and chronic kidney disease and um, infectious disease and brain diseases. We, we want to be an engine of discovery, so we're going to build, further invest in the infrastructure, whether it's chemists, uh, or computational scientists, et cetera, so that we can do a lot of the work in-house and then partner with industry later on. To help that happen, we're uh, putting millions of dollars into an Mount Sinai Accelerator program to be run by Mount Sinai Innovation Partners. So to start, they're getting $10 million to invest in Mount Sinai science so that if you have a finding that needs more funding to become viable from a commercial point of view, we have our own in-house accelerator. We've already given the money for this, so it currently uh, exists. And we've got some very interesting projects, but there may be uh, research going on in your laboratories that we don't know about, so you should contact Eric Liam, who heads the uh, Mount Sinai Innovation Partners. And I, I mentioned we're going to continue to invest uh, in, in areas that we're currently excellent in and, and uh, move that er those areas further. So to do all this, uh, we're going to have to recruit more faculty. And in the last strategic plan, we recruited 150 new research faculty. Uh, we're going to need about the same. And the way we're distributing it in this plan is uh, 90 what we're calling discovery uh, science-based uh, work, and that would be wet lab scientists, translational science or patient-oriented researchers. Uh, those would be physician scientists uh, primarily who are at least 50 percent uh, research, and that we're going to further invest in computational science, big data integration, laboratory 
uh, testing, the development of new laboratory tests, um, and so forth. We do need new space. It's inhibiting our growth, even though this year, by the way, um, our NIH funding ended up September 30th is, is the end of the fiscal year for the government. Uh, we ended up with $318 million in NIH funding, which is by far the biggest, uh, largest we've ever had. We're 13th in the country and closing in on the top 10. So we're doing well there, but we're really going to take a leap when we enhance the, you know, our space. So we're going to need a new research building. So we think the size of the building is going to be comparable to the Hess uh, Center for Science and Medicine. And this is how we're preliminarily going to divide up the space. Uh, we're going to need more clinical space, particularly for cancer. We need more faculty offices. Uh, we need incubator space. In fact, today we're meeting with the city to talk about where we're going to put the building, the air rights associated uh, with the building. So this is, this is moving forward. Here's where we're going to put it. We own space between 102nd and 103rd in Madison. That's uh, right next to the New York Academy of Medicine. There is a parking lot that uh, we own. We bought it for $24 million, only in New York. You know, you're paying $24 million, you know, for a parking lot that is just on the ground. Uh, we own the buildings that are unoccupied right contiguous with that uh, parking lot. That's where Dwayne Reed is next to those, you know, buildings, and, you know, we're hopeful to perhaps get that land too, but even if we don't, we have enough space there to build a new uh, research uh, building. So that's where it will go, and we're quite excited about that. So these are going to be the measures of success of the plan. The usual publications, Grants, IP, these are all things we're going to measure ourselves by, but most important is, is number four. This is uh, how we define ourselves. Uh, we are built as a nimble, entrepreneurial, um, you know, medical school that is the foundation of a great health system to make discoveries as good as well as anybody to improve the lives of our patients. That's what I'm going to hold myself to. And that's what I'm going to hold you to and, you know, other Mount Sinai physicians and scientists. And let me remind you, uh, and, and Scott Friedman has done a lot of work as usual. Uh, we have, this is our sixth Sinai Innovations Conference. It's been great. Uh, we've got a great group of uh, speakers. Again, this year it's the 17th and 18th, and it's focusing on cancer this year. And we also have... This is the second year for the hackathon? Yeah. I've been fighting against that word, hackathon, but uh, we haven't come up with anything better, right? Health hackathon. Health hackathon. So it's, uh, it's well subscribed, right, Scott? Well, we have a, it's full. So we've got a lot of young, um, inspired, inspirational, um, I can change the world, you know, young people participating in, in coming, identifying a problem and coming up with, with possible uh, solutions, and there'll be, uh, there'll be awards associated with it. So it's, uh, it's been a lot of fun. So thank you very much, and I'd be, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Specifically, I think one big need, and probably with your show of hands here, we have a lot of people that do research and stuff, but we don't have like a, it's very difficult when you have a patient with chronic pain and substance abuse to address this issue in Mount Sinai. And I would like for us to be the leaders. Well, again, yeah. we want to be here. The reason we formed the Addiction Research Institute uh, is because of the opioid crisis. And one of the missions of that institute is to discover non-opiate approaches to 
pain uh, management, some new molecules, new drugs, partner with industry to improve methods associated with getting patients off the drugs. I actually was involved in that research uh, early in my career. Uh, and to provide educational resources for our physicians. So that's why we, we developed that, that institute and, and just started. So it's early yet, we're in the recruitment mode of physician scientists to be associated with the institute and uh, to be connected to the health system. The one thing I did not mention is th this strategic plan is just for the school. So, so this is about an 800 million to 900 million plan. There's a separate plan for the health system. You know, and that is, uh, that involves capital projects, uh, the recruitment of physicians for new programs. So it's about the same size. And uh, you know, at some point you can you know, have somebody come to talk about the, the other half of the plan. Led to the health system. This is perhaps more of a national question, but we can look, look at the Mount Sinai as a microcosm. It's great that um, I'm a primary care 100% um, clinician, and um, innovation is fantastic and it's amazing and we need it. How do we make sure that our patients, particularly in the community that we are a major part of, have access to this innovation, can afford this innovation, have access to physicians who are going to, you know, introduce them to this innovation? Um, you know, in a timely manner when we can't even get them albuterol sometimes. <laughs> I can't address the albuterol part, but <laughs> the institution, the Institute for Next Generation Healthcare, led by Joel Dudley, is designed to do something like that. And that's, that, that clinic that he's developing, and, and you should talk to him, is, is designed to utilize new advances in, in digital medicine and that's, that's a broad definition for what that is. But it's, the idea is to bring it to the community. This clinic that he's developed can be established within like a month, right in the community. And patients and, and primary care doctor would be part of it to evaluate vulnerability to heart disease and uh, brain diseases and so forth in a very rapid way, and a way that seems to be fun as well, you know, so it, it, it decreases the, the fear associated with coming to have a, uh, an evaluation of your health and change your lifestyle. So that's being developed to help primary care doctors in, in, in the next generation. And you're young enough to be part of that. So that's part of the plan. Also what Prabhjot is doing in his department as well. Yeah, so it, that's so also what Prabhjot uh, Singh is doing in his department, connecting community to the medical center and, and breaking down that, and making the continuum between the community and the health center will also facilitate that. Any other questions? Everybody's very quiet. Unusually quiet, may I say. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay.